Hi, this is Paula Glory, and this show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole because we like to go into topics more deeply. The show started in September of 2005 after I had been in India for four years. And I was in India for several reasons. One was to understand how to heal heartbreak. I wasn't quite aware that that's what I was there for, but uh, I realized in looking back on it, that's what I wanted to do. And in healing our own heartbreak, we can learn how to help others. I also had uh, come across the horrors of child abuse, particularly pedophilia, and I was interested if I could gain divine knowledge to know how to really resolve something as problematic as pedophilia, not only for the victims, but also why somebody would do that to, to children. So uh, a young master who I studied with had told me I needed to give India a second chance. I'd already started Transcendental Meditation when I was 20 years old, and I felt I really knew what the Indian thing was. And he said, no, you need to really learn about the Divine Mother. And I thought, this is the most peculiar thing. I had no idea what he was talking about. But I figured before I dismissed it, I had to understand it. And in particular, he wanted to focus on how Jesus did the miracles. Well, that was also another thing that I wasn't particularly excited about focusing on because I felt when I'd go to India, there were so many more beautiful things to look at than a man who is nailed on a cross. It's sort of a grisly image. So I began to understand the wisdom and the circumstances all coming together uh, why I was born into the family I was born into, why I had the different religious experiences I did, and why I attracted the attention of other masters who uh, also, in unfolding their soul mission, would, would draw to themselves those that had a harmonious vibration. So four years uh, is a long time. I was there when 9-11 happened, so as an American I wasn't in this country, I wasn't in New York. And when I came back to New York, there was a movie that was very popular called What the Bleep Do We Know? And it was using animation, it was using a story uh, to explain how we create our reality using models from quantum mechanics. Now, stars on this film, I had already videotaped before I left to India. And I felt that the shows that I had, the interviews that I had with these stars, went into the topics more deeply. And so for that reason, they used that metaphor in the movie, farther down the rabbit hole. How far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? So I felt my interviews were going very far, so I called my show Farther Down the Rabbit Hole. It started off every Wednesday at uh, 1 o'clock until 2. I would play a half an hour of these interviews, some of them talking about the resurrection of Jesus, that is a little bit unfamiliar to a Manhattan audience. And in the last half hour, I was certainly expecting to get some feedback. And I did. And so the call-in started coming. And then I used Marshall Rosenberg's principles of nonviolent communication to help to figure out what was on people's minds, why they would accept something too easily, or reject something that socially uh, you know, wasn't part of their, of their background. So, yesterday at St. Mark's Church, I thought I'd seen and heard everything, but I had the wonderful opportunity to hear a sermon uh, from Ron Garner. And he's my guest today, and I want to say, I haven't cried like that for a long time, uh, your story. Can, can you tell my audience, now that you have an idea of what my audience is, about your story and what brought you here and what led to that? amazing sermon. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak at St. Mark's yesterday. It came from another priest here in uh, at New York and it was a great privilege and pleasure to be there to preach on what I call Bible Sunday and then to have the opportunity to speak afterwards about Josephine Butler to that small education group. Uh, she is uh, a woman with whom I've been researching and writing about now for the better part of 10 years, an eminent Victorian, as we might say in England, uh, hallowed in our church calendar over uh, the water uh, as a great social reformer. And when she died in 1906, the media of her time regarded her as one of the 12 most eminent persons of the 19th century. Now you just need to hold on to that for a moment. We're talking one of the 12 most eminent in a century, which includes people like Charles Dickens, 
uh, like uh, Darwin, Henry George, Henry George uh, Trollope, you've got uh, Disraeli and Gladstone, you've got a huge range of eminently successful and remarkable people and she's up there remembered as one uh, worthy of comparison. By the same token, I didn't know who Henry George was until about a year ago uh, when I s sort of stumbled across the Henry George School and then the director gave me a book. And in this day and age of the Internet and me being so active on the Internet and public access television, I don't often take time to read a book. But reading this book, Progress and Poverty, was so moving that as I started to approach the end of the book, I was going slower and slower because I just didn't want it to be over, to be in connection with such a great mind. And one thing that touched me about Henry George, which again repeated and, and it was even more intensified with, with Josephine Butler's story, was his great intimacy with poverty, his real understanding of it, but understanding with such a clarity that it didn't have to be this way. Mm -hmm. and, and giving some <coughs> procedures or, or some, uh, some sense of what very smart people, oftentimes precisely because of their education, were not seeing. And, and again, um, I think what most touched me about this book when I went home and read it, I don't think, I've never thought of myself as having a prayer life, but I realize I have been a regular meditator. And what's made meditation more profound is when there's a real issue in front of you and you're just at your wit's ends what to do about it. And I think you just, you, you naturally call out to pray. And she heard the, the descriptions and how you highlighted it. Hmm. it. It was flabbergasting. I mean... Well, she was a woman that did things that other Victorian women did, but then she took extra steps. She was with the poor. She worked in Liverpool, as I said yesterday, for several years with her husband. She stayed and worked in, in a workhouse that contained up to 5,000 people, prostitutes, vagabonds, the poor people for whom society had no further use, the no bodies and nuisances. Explain to my audience what a workhouse is, yeah, because were, in your book it said it would separate people from their families. Yeah, yeah the, the, the Victorian workhouse was the dread of the English working class. People preferred to die rather than go into the workhouse. You were destitute, economically you were finished, you, you were of no value to society anymore, and these places were huge huge industrial, almost like factories, where you received minimal food, where you, you lived and worked. You, on Christmas Day you could be separated from your own family. The conditions were very adverse, they were degrading, they gave people no hope. It was basically abandon hope or all you who enter here. Did they, was it slave labor? Did you say work? Or yeah. Were it, 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 what it, work were they doing? Very, very, very menial tasks in, in, in this Liverpool workhouse. Women would have huge, huge long strands of rope and just be cutting off the, the rough edges to make them more pliable and serviceable. It really was the, the, very, the, the, very the, the end, uh, end of the road and people who spent their time there had no access to anything else in, in their life. But unlike her contemporaries, Josephine didn't go there to patronize the poor. She didn't go there to lift the poor up and make them morally better. She saw that these were made in the image of Christ, that they were God's men and, and women. She was there to learn from them and serve them. And when their lives sometimes were coming to an end, as I said yesterday, she would take them home to her own home mm -hmm. and allow them to have dignity in their dying, be given a decent funeral, not a pauper's grave, and have something of the, the care and the, the human love and compassion that they'd been denied for much of their life. Remember that many of these women in these workhouses, I said yesterday, one in five women in London before Josephine was born were prostitutes. Many of those were forced into it out of economic necessity or rape or abuse by their Victorian masters. They, they had no A economic domestic option. Domestic like Domes maids. Domestic yes. servants and taken advantage of. And as soon as they fell pregnant, they were thrown out. And Victorian standards of uh, morality and respectability, you have to remember in England, 
19th century, respectability was everything. If you didn't conform to those strict moral codes, you were disowned and uh, right. ignored. Right. So Josephine is able to care for the poor in a way that's different from some of her contemporaries. And she does this with, with energy, with compassion. And that she's able to do it for so long is something to do with this, what I would call interior life. Right. That enables her to keep on doing what she does when someone who'd merely been a social actor activist might have despaired or grown weary. Mm -hmm. No, she wasn't. She, I think perhaps if I had ever come across her in the past, maybe I would have just bumped it as, as some kind of, uh, uh, you know, austere, not very fun person that just right. has to hang around poor people. Quite, to, to, yes. To, to, you know, a peculiar person or, or just not fun. Uh, we, we have but, but she was a fun person, yes. actually. She came from a background where you said she was some considered the most beautiful woman in Europe. Indeed, yes. And yeah. from a landed family. She, she was, yes. Her father, uh, uh, John Gray, had uh, many important influential social contacts, was held to have the ear of the Prime Minister, was a Justice of the Peace, a magistrate, a keen opponent mm -hmm. of slavery, and worked tirelessly to, to bring that to an end uh, in England and America. She, she drew her inspiration from him, um, in, in, in part, um, but she wasn't prim, she wasn't austere, she wasn't what we say in England, the Lady Bountiful, who went round the parishes dispensing goodness and charity, right. but actually remained unmoved by the plight of the poor, right. either an out of duty or a kind of condescension, neither of those. Here is a woman who is, is beautiful, who is cultivated, who loves nature, who loves books, who loves to play the piano, who treasures the, the manuscripts of Beethoven uh, piano sonatas given to her by mother when she's a child, who loves horse riding, who marries a teacher of classics, who himself is a remarkable man and right. enjoys a marriage of 38 years, right. where there's great conviviality and joy. Right. Uh, but clearly as the years went on and the great cause of her life, which is to possess her from 1870, there was less time for such things. But then she was a woman under a great sense of a religious vocation. She was called by God to do something that she actually wept tears on her pillow because she was so fearful of what it would do for her, what it would do to her husband's reputation and career, what it would mean in terms of being socially ostracized so by, by her contemporaries. She so could she, see all that down the line. She saw that in a flash. She, 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 she knew how Victorian society worked. She knew about uh -huh. the hypocrisy uh -huh. in relation to prostitution. She right. knew that women were not expected to have right. a voice or you, opinions. You know, now I know why, if, if I ever did run across her, why I probably wouldn't have gotten into it, is because you made it so clear she wasn't moralizing. It wasn't about moralizing. She absolutely, it was more, she was not a moralizer. No, it was more about a completion of her understanding of life, to make her life, it, which, which is very, which makes one think about Buddha. Buddha was born in a palace. He was a prince. And it wasn't until he sort of peeked over the fence because they were keeping anything unhappy away from him. And then once he saw some poor person going through the street who was dead, he found out about death. And then it, it just was riveted in, in his awareness to try to resolve. Yes, what I'd this agree is. with that. I think I'd want to qualify it in one way that although she did have an affluent background from an early age, from a teenage years, barely 20, she had been exposed to poverty That's true. and the plight of the poor. She saw and the consequences. Her father was an abolitionist. He was an abolitionist, but she also went to Ireland and saw the effects of the yes, potato in farm in there. Yes, in 1847, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Th now, that is and something. she's barely 20 at that right. point. Now, there's something that Henry George, when he explained what the Irish famine was, I was, again, astonished because he explains, and, and this is where I think a lot of times people feel, oh, religious people are just sort of, they're in the heavens and say everything's right and everything's perfect, yeah. and, or else they're so fanatical the other way, you know, just relentlessly feeding the poor, that, that we're not really moving forward on, a, on an overall comprehensive design level to figure out how to get each member of the society uh, connected with each other. Yes. So in the potato fa uh, the potato famine, uh, one thing I used to puzzle about: if these Irish immigrants were so poor, how did they ever get the passage to come here? And he explained it in one chapter in Social uh, Problems. 
called human garbage. They were picked up in Ireland yeah. and taken across the ocean just like you move the, the barges of garbage out of Manhattan yeah. and then they're dumped onto another mm. continent. You remember yesterday I said that Josephine described prostitutes as ticketed human flesh. Right. They're simply as, as bodies to be used, enjoyed, and then disposed, and of. disposed of the commodification of the body, whether it was for labor yes. or for sexual gratification, right. it came down to the same thing. Now you could see then with that feeling and that uh, sort of hard heartedness, why Darwin would be accepted because he talks about the survival of the fittest. Yeah. And again, Henry George in Progress and Poverty uh, takes, I think he, he goes into the the fallacy of wages at the beginning is his basic premise is that wages goes down, interest goes down, and rent goes up. So rent means whoever gets there first and controls the resources is eventually going to make, as a matter of time, slaves out of everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that it's not a competition of interest or capital, like there's a limited pool of capital, but that in truth it's human beings that create wealth. So that it's the human beings that are the greatest resource. And so to me, when you were explaining that she saw the face of Christ in these prostitutes, she really is saying that this really is the greatest beauty in, in human beings and that they need to be brought to their rightful dignified circumstances. Yes. She has a dual image of what it means to be in Christ. She has a view that we are men and women made in the image and likeness of God. And we're able to see the likeness of God in human life when it's elevated, when it's lived to its full potential, when it shows that beauty and truth. But she also sees it in the brokenness of the human person. And this is the great departure. The philanthropists, the do-gooders, the moralizers, they just saw in the poor people who were casualties maybe victims of their own bad behavior. There was a school of thought in mid-19th century England called moral physiognomy. You looked at a person's face, and merely by the quality of their face, you deemed whether they were worthy of your compassion or not. Extraordinary, no. But that was a persuasive argument for some well, people. Well, see, that, that's what I mean, again, by the, the pedophilia search I was doing. I was horrified. I was pretty old before I realized this happened to children. But if you think about it more deeply, what is going on with the pedophile that they would have to have gratification that way? So again, there's some great Victorians uh, besides Henry George at that time. There's also Alexander of the Alexander Technique. He was an actor who lost his voice. So uh, Sigmund Freud was yeah. coming along then. It's William Booth, the Salvation Army, founder of the Salvation Army. We spoke briefly yesterday, yes. 1889, 1890, in darkest England. He has to write to the Times newspaper, I mean, the, the, the organ of record which the successful people of the time read, to remind people of what was happening in the streets of London. In darkest England, there was a shadow side that the urban poor, the, the state of the poor on the streets, the potential for agitation and social upheaval, but m most of all the fact that people were living in squalor that was unimaginable because of course they were herded into the tenements. They were in appalling parts of London, your ghettos as you would say now, that nobody went to and nobody wanted to know about. You knew it was there, so but you, you drew those curtains but, and you, but you forgot see, about them. You not only have to be courageous to go there, people yeah. can do that. Yeah. But then she went to Parliament. I mean, she got petitions when it said five miles long, yep. signatures that That's they right. taped together and yeah. I guess rolled up and put on a cart. This is woman in 10 years has 17,000 petitions, 17,000 petitions, right, right. who organizes almost a thousand meetings, who writes pamphlets after pamphlets, and one petition, as you said, was so long, it needs three buses right. to contain it. And then when it's presented to the honorable members of parliament, they stand up and they mock her in derision. Right. Now this is why she cried on her pillow, because she could flash forward and see that this is the type of reception. She could see that this, this was going to be a long night of travail. Right. There was no instant success here. This was a campaign that would take her to 1885 from 1870. Well, 1864 they had the Contagious Act. That's could right. You, the could you explain yes, what the that is? This, this, this is the heart of the this matter, really. Blow your mind, the, the, this is the heart of the matter. And try and keep it as simple as possible, because yeah. it contains so many subtle implications. 
This was held to be a good thing. Parliament passes a legislation that medics and politicians and successful Victorian businessmen and clerics approve of because it cleans up women in the big towns and cities where there are military barracks and some people wanted to go beyond that they wanted to go to all major cities because all major cities have prostitutes prostitutes are sewers I know okay. I, I was so struck by that let's, term. Let's, to, let's, to treat human beings prostitutes like sewers. are sewers and you, 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 sewer you, management the, and, and it's <laughs> sewer management so once you've had your gratification if you're going to use a woman again you want it to be clean she's only ticketed human flesh but you don't want gonorrhea syphilis venereal disease so what do you do you give a magistrate power to empower officers to stop any woman merely on suspicion right and you can lock them up for three months and here you can subject them to the most horrendous medical internal investigations now there were some people who were alert and awake to this who saw that medically this was inappropriate because the surgical invasion of a woman medically caused hemorrhaging and death yes, yes. some people were awakened to the moral dimension of this that this was an opportunity for men to interfere with women under the guise of medicine or, right. or, the, or, or keeping women clean and certainly that happened but it was Josephine alone and remember Florence Nightingale the great heroine of the 19th century, even the lady with the lamp, even right? she bows out yeah. with all her persuasive powers. But it's Josephine who it's says, It's like too hot to handle. It's too hot to handle. And it's just the, the resistance to it from men is so powerful. You, you, you were taking on what another great social reformer called the thing, capital T, capital T. The, oh, thing, really? is the thing is the vested power of interest, of parliament, of the establishment, of the way the world worked in England to ensure that only the political will so, so you're, of masters obtains. Right, you're, you're interfering with the unspoken recreation of the elite? <laughs> you're taking on the establishment, you're going up to Capitol Hill, you're taking right. issue with what St. Paul would call the powers and principalities. But here's the thing, she saw Josephine, this wasn't just medically wrong, not just morally wrong, this was a constitutional crime with the Magna Carta this right? was an affront to human liberty you so cannot pretty. stop someone merely on suspicion lock right. them up for three months because they're a woman and then without any recourse to justice do the most horrendous things so that men can continue to take their pleasure with them right right now, what about uh, homosexuality and children, pedophilia? Was that not the concern, or was it not it's, happening then? It's, it's not the that, well, you know, there's a famous I mean, novel. It's sort of new to me. Th yeah. there's, there's a famous novel in late 19th century England called The, uh, the, well, of Lonely, the well of Loneliness. Uh, and, of course, Oscar Wilde, the love that dare not speak its name. There were things that people were aware of, but simply this was not spoken of in respectable society. So, again, you had the hypocrisy of the blind eye that chose not to see. But because she was, remember I said one, yesterday, one of her favorite aphorisms was from American aboli abolitionist, I will be heard. I will be heard. Because this was a matter of truth, God's truth, she had seen what was the case. And the more she researched and traveled around Europe, and then of course came into sexual trafficking of women and children, right. the king of Belgium, annually having a hundred virgins shipped to his court and palace from England from England merely for his sexual pleasure the so, so now that implies that the economy of England is so devastated that there's so many poor versus very few rich that you could have another economy Belgium come in because wouldn't they have their own virgins in Belgium uh, well, quite quite possibly but the, the the fact that the English the English practice we weren't, I don't want to become too uh, sort of um, salacious here, to use a big word, but um, England was well known for its predilection for sexual uh, malpractices, for sexual mm -hmm. predilection. More than other countries, uh, more I think than more France, than other Germany, countries. Well, remember, you, this is this great burgeoning metropolis, A. London. B, London. B, as I said yesterday, before she was born, 
Georgian England was replete with prostitution from the from the madame in her boudoir right. who could ply her trade with gentlemen regularly right. for, for, for formidable sums of money and live in a style that most people could barely dream of down to the people in the gin soap palaces that were offering their bodies several times a night to anyone and 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 living in oblivion the rest of the time because their lives were so desperate right. no, nobody a lot knew of drug use was oh, they, drug, they didn't everything even have that then? oh they did just laudanum and opium and the the the, the level uh, the, uh, you know i i talked about my phd yesterday briefly I understand why some clergy were reluctant to serve in the slums. It wasn't because they, their feelings were very fastidious or they said, I couldn't possibly do that. It was a kind of madhouse. Right. It, 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 uh, and, uh, right. Clerics right. were English gentlemen. Right. They were placed in parishes to refine the population. They were overwhelmed. They were completely overwhelmed. Right. And under the urban the urban towns had no infrastructure for the import of the rural poor when the Industrial Revolution began to take its full impact in the early 19th century. So it's a very complex I, you know, issue. Yeah, it, it's a complex and it's a deep issue and I'm trying to get the most, the parts that touch me the most about this slim book which I know is a is a condensation of a much bigger, more scholarly volume yeah. that you were part of putting together. Yes. Um, w let me just tell one little brief story. In India, uh, there was a little boy coming up to me to sell me uh, a l box full of little idols. I don't know, little Krishna and Hanuman. And, and he's starting to take a breath and pull one out, and, he's, and you can feel a, a connection he's having with what he's doing. And I said, okay, I'll buy it. And it was like I took the wind out of him. Even though that was his purpose, was to sell it to me, he didn't get to really kind of complete his his pride of of his profession, I guess. And you talked in this book about how poor people, oftentimes, although they may be asking for money, what they're really wanting is a human connection. And if you yeah. just cast <laughs> coins at them quickly and scurry away, you you explain that so well how we need to have this connection and that the rich without this connection are bereft of the fullness of life so if people don't want to think in christian metaphor seeing the face of jesus or whatever yeah. something is is missing when the poor And there are some uh, who are not in our in our society. We're not connecting with you have the, the rich are, are impoverished. That's what I'm saying. Yes, for I lack th of this, I think the, the rich often solve their conscience by putting the hand in the pocket. But Josephine gave the but poor. But it doesn't work. Does no, it, it doesn't mean? work because I think the poor know when they're being patronized or where they're being wrongly. Uh, on, or, or that on, the rich aren't feeling richer for the connection. No, it's it's a it's almost a gratuitous gesture. But but yes. Josephine gave the poor what uh, you would now call FaceTime. Yes. <laughs> She gave him FaceTime. She gave off herself. She she emptied herself. She she listened. She sat alongside. She learned. By by being with them, she learned more about their actual situation and what needed to be done. And remember, I know we can't fit everything in yeah, here today. This was a great cause of a life, but it came after extraordinary work in education. That he was a woman who set up the first college for women in Cambridge, one of our most prestigious universities, mm -hmm. in matters of equality of pay, in matters of education, in matters of opinion, in matters of opportunity. Women were the equal of men. And she got this 120 years before American women in the 1960s were standing up and saying the same thing. And so she's now being keenly followed in England, in, 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 in the academic world, uh, by, by women who are interested in that as a feminist, way, way ahead of the time, a proto-feminist, who saw what others just didn't get, that women were more than domestic goddesses, were more than people who cooked the meal, were more than those who were sexually servile to their husbands. Mm -hmm. She was a woman who was valiant for truth.
Now, another thing when you talk about feminism, a lot of times uh, making women right is at the expense of men being wrong. She couldn't have accomplished what she did without the support of her husband. No. And he was a, a pretty extraordinary man because he would have to have been dragged into all of this. Yeah, I have to tell you in my prayer book, uh, in my church where I pray each morning and evening, I have both their pictures, George and Josephine. They were married for 38 years. Uh, he fell in love with her almost instantly when she was barely 20. They were married three years later. He didn't particularly want to be a Victorian parson. He was primarily an educationalist in his career, head of boys' schools in Cheltenham and Liverpool. But he consented to her ordination. And, uh, because of her? I think because, like her, in a different way, less dramatically, he felt that God was calling him to do this. Right. Uh, and therefore he had to... Well, you to definitely need a lot of energy above and beyond social mediocrity. To, uh, to address these kinds of problems. Yeah. And that's what I meant about the prayer life. It seems as though it's great to have a nice transcendental experience, and I love the Rig Veda and the, you know, the chanting, and I love the Gregorian chants, and I yeah. love ritual in church, but you get to a point where if you just only do that, it gets sort of, it sort of tapers off. The buzz just dies out. Yeah. But if you expose yourself to the totality of what life is, which is including everyone in our society, and looking at things that are not pleasant, it yeah. seems as though that sets up a situation where there's like a vacuum and you have to suck in the spiritual energy. I think she was morally heroic. Uh, and again, prevalent in America and England now, spirituality, when we talk about these things, it's often seen as a way of massaging one's own ego. Mm -hmm. It's a term of self-fulfillment. I think any proper understanding of Christian spirituality is that which moves us to a deeper level of intensity and awareness about the way the world is. And in Josephine, you see how the world is. And right. in, her, in the quietness and darkness of her prayer, she cries out to God about the desperation of the world. She cries out about the injustice that she sees around her and how will she, one woman uh, with a husband, address these social ills and evils, this these, these great darkness. And then the energy comes. And the then the energy, energy comes, comes and out of that, but it right. equips her to do work for the sake of the other. Her right. work is always for the other. And it came at tremendous personal cost, so now, as I said yesterday. Yeah, I know. The tr now, the tremendous personal cost, she's kind of got a frail constitution. She has. She's going in these yeah. really dreadful environments. Yeah. And yet, she actually lives to be, I think, in her 80s? Yes, yeah, she's 78 when she dies. She outlives George by 16 years. He was nine years her senior. Right. His health was indifferent for several years before he died. She often takes trips that she well, ought not to. Well, he was an athlete. To. He was robust. He was an athlete. He was jumping over five-foot gates. As uh, He was a teacher of classics. A, a gentle giant, very right. compassionate man, a handsome man. But most of all, a man who let her go. You know, when she makes that decision, where this is the work, the Contagious Diseases Act, oh, she she weeps into a pillow. She writes him a note. She can't even talk to him about this. She writes the letter and she puts it in his study. She leaves and she comes back, and he is ashen faced. Ashen faced. He's ashen faced yeah. because he knows a, she has to do this. But he knows, even before it begins, what the cost will be. And what the cost will be is 15, 16 years of arduous toil, of separation, of social ostracization by friends, of fear for her life and her safety. Remember, this is a woman that they try to burn alive on the second floor yes, when yes. she's campaigning Talk for a politician it. who wants to get this, Here they this, just sort of this disease repealed. Here they change your traffic on the internet, but there they actually have to light, light a fire yeah. under the floors yeah. of where she's lecturing. And when... And when, when uh, when she's speaking at these uh, by-elections, uh, in order to get into the room to speak for the candidate, who is a representative of the National Women's Federation, she has to go in disguise because if she's recognised, they won't let her in anyway. And this is yeah. in a democracy. Right. And, and how is it? Why do the police take so long to get to the scene of the crime? Mysteriously. Hello? Yeah. Mysteriously. No policemen arrive. And there's a fire. Yes. 
Yes. This is really sinister stuff. Well, see, but, but you know, the sinister stuff continues. Like I say, how come we don't know about her? <laughs> we know about a lot of activist good causes and feminism is a big thing. And yet, to get the knowledge that you need to be effective, you really have to dig around she and... Is and at one of my great Victorian lucky. heroes. Like, I'm well, glad yeah. I went to church yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> you get lucky, but one of my great Victorian heroes, theologians, a man called Frederick Denison Morris, said the theologian must dig. And I'm a theologian, a priest, and written right. several books now, and it's one of my maxims: you have to dig. This woman spoke from the heart with a head. She spoke from the heart and right. it was processed through her head. She took the enemy on at its own game. She knew the arguments better than they did. She knew the constitutional deal. She was able the to... The constitutional the, deal? The, the, yeah, she, the, the, the constitutionally, she was able with great eloquence but brain to make gradually the point that this cannot be. What, what, that this is yeah. a constitutional affront. Right. Not just right. morally wrong. Right. It's a constitutional affront. Right. But what do you think about separation of church and state? Because, because she gets a lot of energy from uh, the inspiration of Jesus, and yet you see that that has oftentimes been used against people. Like, you know, the, I, I actually met the nun that inspired Dead Man Walking, and right. I came up to her and I said, you know, you know, uh, people like you really offset the Inquisition. And, and she's a very hardy person funny person so yes. she took that in the right in yes. the right light but yes it's like, like it, relentless an institution can help you without an institution you're all by yourself yeah. and and yet institution only doesn't do it very often at all no no it, this is a double whammy um, on the one hand, she's what I call the gifted loner. It's not that she works only on her own. She forms this national women's association. So she's savvy in knowing where to endless support. But one area where she could have done more, been sustained more, was within the establishment of the Church of England, mm -hmm. which had many good people. And there were, incidentally, people seriously interested in social reform did from the 1850s onwards. But she Did appears, she turn them off? No, I'm sh no, she didn't. In fact, another one of my heroes, Henry Scott Holland, there's a little anecdote in the uh -huh. book where he's, he's in a cab just going down and he sees her at a distance and the campaign is already underway and her face is already lined and grey and he can see the ravages that this campaign that is taking right. upon her. Yeah. But she wasn't interested in church politics. She wasn't interested in all the doctrinal disputes. And, you know, again yesterday in the sermon, if you remember, as a child, she was inoculated against the Church of England. She found sermons dull, right. clergymen unremarkable. She was right. fired by traveling preachers. She liked the kind of apocalyptic, um, the people with a message to recognize there was an urgency in the gospel. And primitive Methodism actually claimed her much more than the Church of England did. It was almost incidental that her husband became an Anglican priest and then a canon of Winchester. Does she remind you at all of Annie Besant? Do you, did you ever look into that? With the, um, the, the I, match I, thing? I, I don't know enough to make yeah. a comparison okay. there. Okay, okay. Uh, where, where would you like to see your work going with this? <laughs> I guess I have a mission to explain, one, and secondly, just to make her better known. Because, first of all, at merely the level of education, here is a remarkable woman who stands just comparison with the greatest in the 19th century. 19th century, an intensely interesting period in, 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 in religious and political history in England. Also. Yeah, there were great So thoughts, many like extraordinary say, things Freud, going on. You know. The whole deal is yeah. just a fascinating It wasn't century. all sexual repression. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't all sexual. No, no, no. Sadly, the sad thing was that the Victorian gentlemen had to take their pleasures with the woman that they disowned or claimed no knowledge of or respect for. That was yes. a great Victor, you must. If you haven't read it, read John Fowles, a French lieutenant's woman, a, a mediocre film with Meryl Streep, a remarkable novel, oh, really? and he begins each chapter of that great book with a little sort of vignette about Victorian England, and so often it comes back to the Victorian repression. Well, well then you've got people like Sigmund Freud, like I say, who is yes, who's very later. courageous and brave to, yes. to, to start to address these things. I was at the Center for Modern Psychoanalytic Studies, and I picked up a book, I don't know what the, you know, the 
clinical term for masturbation is, but as I'm reading through it, doctors just to explore this were were rather ostracized. Yes. And and the most unbelievable things were believed. You know, your hand would fall off, you'd go blind. Absolutely. And then religious people would cite scientific reasons not to do it. Biblical. And the scientists and biblical. And the scientists would uh, would cite moral reasons. And yes. nobody was on steady ground to really no. to really understand that this is about elevating consciousness. And that's what I found so exciting about the book was I I never saw such a familiar description of a prayer life that I could relate to, yeah. where, where you see a problem, your heart breaks over it, and you stay persistent with it. You don't compensate and sort of turn away and compromise, but you stay at it, and then the energy comes. The staying at it, if we've got time to say yeah. this, this is really important, because I don't believe, I, I've spent 30 years working in urban ministry with the poor and mass, matters of housing and homelessness in England, those happen to be my areas of competence, if you like, um, and often when I speak with clergy gatherings, I say, if you're going to do this for the long term, remember Jesus only has three years and he's dead and he's only 33, you're only being ordained at 33, you're going to do this for 30 or 40 years, you will quickly burn out. Right. You cannot do this work right. long term right. without grace, without the possibility of renewal. And uh, I'm doing this as a mission to explain, but you, also you, you to say... You explain that very well. well that's, you explain thank that you, very but well. She, she is a character that can educate and enable you today to last the course, that the merge, the fusion of the interior and the exterior, of the personal and the political, of prayer and social action, she manages at con terrible cost, I have to say, but then the gospel exacts a terrible cost. It's, it's th I there are no dollar bills on the cross, as I said yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's really, I mean, I, I think, well look, at, recently I did a documentary about radioactive stones, and it was based on uh, discussions that Jane Goldberg, who was writing a book, was having with scientists. So as I'm editing it, I've got the radioactive stones on my own body, and my eyesight improves really dramatically. I'm not having to use my reading glasses anymore. Now, because I was so focused on the topic, I had to organize all of these film clips of the different scientists. I had to figure out what they were saying. If different ones were contradicting each other, I had to figure out how to put that in. So all told, I had a whole lot of knowledge floating around about low-level radiation. So when my own symptoms of nausea, of headache, of ringing in the ears would come up, I wouldn't push the stones away. I'd, I'd weather through it. And then the other side was I had this remarkable breakthrough. And when your eyesight improves, which is supposed to, with Chinese medicine, be associated with the liver meridian, a whole lot of other things get better. Your memory gets sharper. You have more enthusiasm, feelings like you had when you were a child. So when you say that it, it exacted a great cost, yeah. I understand that. Yes. And I understand her heartache. I understand the depression. Uh, you know, just, there's just the dismal uh, destitutedness where you feel the limitation of you as a human being. But when the renewal comes in and the support comes there, there was no other way to get that. In other words, she made some breakthrough. Seventy-eight years old in that day was, was quite elderly. Indeed, indeed it was, yes. You know, and, and today you're seeing people with better health care and so on using some therapies and, and you wouldn't put a dog through it, mm. through, through some of what the privileged and the lucky get. Some people are being killed by too much insurance indeed, or, or, yes. or applied with... With, uh, with a wrong understanding. Yes. Uh, I think the gift of silence, she would, she would urge silence on people today, that without that retreat into the what Catherine of Siena, her, her great mentor, and she wrote the biography of her, remember, in the 18... Uh, and also in, Teresa the of Avila. Teresa of Avila. The, 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 the interior space, if you don't make that, if you don't carve that out, you won't survive. And, and there she found the grace of God to carry on and, um, and, 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 and survive. And it seems to me the great legacy of a life is that one person can and does make a difference. And they, and they, they carve out their own way, like St. Teresa. Uh, I was just reading a, a little book that 
a very interesting publisher put together who I hope to get. I think her name is Miriam Starr. I hope to get her as a guest. She, uh, she's exploring the lives of these saints, and she said that St. Teresa's father or grandfather was a converted Jew in, in Spain, and they had to go through a very degrading ceremony to make it's this happen. To make happen. the change, yes. And, and as a result, he didn't want his darling daughter to, uh, to, to, to go into the religious life at all because what he sort of purchased or had accomplished was a stature in a society where you couldn't move if you weren't Christian. And then his daughter, or granddaughter, whoever it was, is starting to take it so incredibly seriously. And But again, when she describes her religious life, because I've read St. Teresa's books carefully, it's not quite like Josephine Butler, but uh, Josephine Butler, I think, saw more horrors than St. Teresa did, although I probably things were pretty dismal for her. Well, of course, she had the Inquisition, right? Indeed, Saint yes. Had the Inquisition That's right. Yeah. Running. Yes, yes. She would have seen a different kind of horror, perhaps, uh, religious cruelty and intolerance. Now, to throw off all of these maladies of, of society, uh, you, you also say that a lot of uh, religious people busy themselves so much saying that that's their prayer life. And oh yes, that's a is, subtle is that point, out? isn't it? Yeah. Uh, more a cop out than a burnout. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think uh, yeah, I, I quote someone else there, Elred Squire, I think, and this is not meant to be prissy or, or sort of one-upmanship, but he talks about those people who say, "My whole life is my prayer," and okay, there can be very good lives that are, have a certain level of consciousness and mindfulness uh, that, that, that that exhibit that kind of thing, but I think. Her life is a testimony to the fact that time has to be given specifically and only to that place and space where God may speak in you and to you. It's the desire and preparedness to make yourself available for no other reason that God may work in you. So it's prayer for its own sake and God's sake and the world's sake that isn't going on while you're doing something else. Now, what do you do when someone says, how do you pray? How do you pray? Yeah, someone said, okay, you convince me, I want to do it, but when oh. I close my eyes, nothing happens. <laughs> or my grandmother would say, I have to be in trouble, boy, then I can pray. <laughs> the prayer of, <laughs> prayer of desperation. <laughs> the prayer when you're at 31,000 feet. But, but she was also a pretty jolly person, and I mean, uh, we used to have priests come over for dinner, and my grandfather would get up and go to bed at 8 o'clock, because that's when he went to bed at 8 o'clock. He oh. wasn't overly impressed. And my grandmother would always say, well, if there's a God in heaven, he surely didn't put, it, put us here to sin or suffer. So, so she had a certain resiliency to her. But at the same time, I think she was also longing for something profound. Yeah, yeah. I th the work of prayer is, is mysterious and it's manifold. It's, it's, it's many faceted. And we pray for different reasons. We intercede for others. We contemplate. We pray for our own strength and renewal. So it's a, it's a diamond with many facets, doesn't it? But my own experience of trying to pray now for my ministry of 30 years is that prayer is work and it's hard work mm -hmm. and it's high work and it's our work because we are mandated to pray when you pray. Jesus right. says to disciples, when you pray, interestingly, he doesn't say, if you pray. He says, right. when you pray, use these words. Right. So I've always seen prayer well, as, as work, but not that's, 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 that's had to be absorbed in some grudging way as right. a great menial task. It is that which is part of being a Christian. Right. So it's like if you got an automobile with a full tank of gas and you say, okay, go and drive around, but eventually the tank is going to need to be refilled. Yeah. And, and so there's a science to it. it. It doesn't have to be a moralizing thing. It's just uh, kind of like a word to the wise. I think you want to right. get intensely involved I think there's life. an intelligence to it. Yeah. Right. I think there's an intelligence and a structure and a rigor. There's a knowledge and knowingness about it. And there's no, no amount of buying self-help books, no amount of books about prayer, no amount of time reading about prayer will ever make you a prayer unless you resolve to try and do it. It's in the doing. You've got to do it, as it were, from the it's, inside. It's, it seems as though it does involve a certain amount of heartbreak, though, before you really... something... I, I don't know, is it our ego, our arrogance? We just think we don't need to do this, and then something comes along, you oh my God, 
I for sure need to do this. Yeah, a friend of mine who was an atheist trained at the same time for me as minister, as a priest, and when he made the retreat... He, he became a priest even he, though he's an no, atheist? No, 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 he was an atheist. Oh, I see. Uh, I and a very, wow. <laughs> very able mathematician, and then in his mid-late 20s felt this weird call, went on a retreat, and the mother superior talking to him on retreat, I remember this from all those years, he said, you are no use to God until you've been broken. Mm -hmm. And you can understand that negatively. It doesn't mean that I God know, wants to I hammer know. you into pieces. It's hard to explain this. But it's that dissolution of the ego, right. the idea that I'm not right. the most important thing. Uh, you know that thing from G.K. Chests and angels can fly. Why? Because they think lightly of themselves. Right. Because right. they've got themselves off the hands. Right. And that, that for me, prayer is, is taking me away from myself and exposing me to the joy and the sorrow of the world and what I do with both of those things. She, she never ceased to see the joy. She didn't turn into some harridan, some careworn, frustrated, tired... Oh, yeah, she would have burnt out decades she, before she, she, she remained. Died. She yeah, remained yeah. the apple of her husband's eyes. Right. She was loved. Yeah, Although you got I, the feeling they really loved th each they other. They loved her. I have to say, though, if you may not come to the end of the book yet, oh, the yeah, second son, George, her firstborn, uh, he, he falls off a horse, uh, has a horse riding accident. Oh. It damages his brain oh. to some degree. In his later years, after uh, his dad died, named after his dad, he resented his mother for the fact that she was yes. not there for him. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, now, when yeah, she yeah. writes her own, when she looks, when she writes George's biography two years after his death, she writes about that in a way that I think, to some degree, is a little self-justifying. Oh, really? I, my, my sense is, if if I were a psychoanalyst, which I'm not, there might be there that she would a, a fact about her own life she would find hard to take on board is that clearly the work sometimes took precedence over her family. Yeah. yeah but that yeah. was the deal. Yeah. So it seems as though her husband must have had a great love of the classics or his own thing going that he wouldn't have been overshadowed by this lack of attention. He he writes to her constantly when she's away. He he worries constantly about her health. Their reunions right. are yeah. intense and passionate. And his letters his letters to her are heartbreaking. Really? Heartbreaking in their beauty. Yes. Um, yes. Their, their their love for each other never dimmed. And of course he travels with her sometimes on these European tours. It's uh, he's there as a companion. We have five more minutes left. Yeah. What, how would you like to use that five minutes to oh. connect with an American audience? Well, we've done pretty good so far. Yeah. I can't <laughs> believe how quickly the time passes, but I'm going to really enjoy editing this. You know, a few, uh, very close here, there's a man who saw the Blessed Virgin Mary when he was seven years old. And uh, it's a really interesting story. We read an article in the New York Times and since I'd just been back from India with this young master who was trying to tell me about these things, I thought, wow, you know, here it is in my own backyard. So even though, well, the article was written like an intellectual would write it, sort of demeaning or, or you know, really not believing in it. But we were intrigued and we went out and saw him. He was a little suspicious if it was going to be more of the same. What was interesting is she came down for 16 days after World War II when so many people were heartbroken. Mothers were crying for their sons who were fallen in World War II. And um, on the 16th day, there were 30,000 people gathered and there would be these remarkable healings, even though he was the only one that could see her. What, does, what do Anglicans or Episcopalians think about this or do? Mm. Anglicans are perhaps not the best people to ask. I say this from a, a, an English perspective. We haven't really got our act together about the Virgin Mary. She she has a place in our calendar. But in terms of being an object of devotion, of reverence, as, as an icon of the Christian life, basically Anglicans leave that to Rome. There are two dogmas, the Immaculate Conception um, and the Assumption but into I Heaven. Don't, I don't think this was about about worship or devotion it was it was a little innocent boy and he said yeah. you know i wasn't even good in catechism he goes i didn't he goes no, no. gee she had to teach me the rosary he's feeling he's still feeling kind of guilty about that yeah i think you, she's you just, know, she's it's not just a phenomenon you it's know? A, yeah then the bishop came by and frank sinatra gave a statue and it's crumbling now and the roof is you know his whole life is 
now he's heartbroken. Yeah. He had this huge experience, and he's in his 60s, and he's totally heartbroken because no experience matches what this was like. And she no. came down also with what we would call a Star of David, which is something a little innocent kid wouldn't realize. And some people say in the little shrine that he set up in the Bronx, it looks like a, a synagogue. No. But I'm just saying from the science of it. See, what I find exciting about this book is you start to delineate more of a science of prayer. In other words, if a guy goes out helping the poor constantly and he's saying, well, that's my prayer, it's a cop-out. It's not that. It, it, it could be a cop-out, but it's going to be a dead end fairly quickly because he won't have the resources to carry on. Yeah. Not doing it uh, right. for extensively Like you say, Jesus hit, had to hit his stride yeah. in three years. Absolutely. <laughs> and I speak with social workers and AIDS workers in Liverpool, and, and they're very respectful sometimes of the Anglican clergy who live and work in the same place, and they're available 24-7. And they say to me, we do our work, but at 5 o'clock we go home, and we come back to it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. She never went home, Josephine. She went home periodically. And the Anglican clergy doesn't go home either? Well, they, they, they live where they work. Their house is uh, open. Their, their name and their address is on their church notice board, and people right. come to us day or night. So they know they've figured out their balance, how to get well, their they, prayer they, life? Well, they, they, they do or they don't. I mean, that's the challenge, and it's sometimes a tragedy that depression and ministerial burnout comes too soon for some because they're full of zeal, but they, they are, and this is in the book, Josephine was occasionally guilty of the sin of the gross mismanagement of herself. Oh, really? But it seems to me that's inevitable for anyone who's serious about following mm -hmm. Christ.